Hi. Over the last 12 months on this channel, I've had the privilege to interview some of the smartest people in the world of vein treatments. I'm not going to name them all, but if you're a doctor, nurse or healthcare professional interested in veins and how to treat them, check out some of the links below. Now, one of the ways to think deeply about what we do and why we do it is to debate with someone who has a completely different view. Problem is, many of us, myself included, feel very uncomfortable when we're challenged or introduced to a different way of thinking. Most of us feel much more comfortable when we're with our own tribe, people with similar views and values. There's a name for it, groupthink. We all tend to go to conferences and meetings that validate what we do. We give more regard to publish evidence that supports what we do. Now, one person who's shattered some of my long-held beliefs is Chris Pittman. He's probably the very first person who's really debated with me. In this video, we get stuck in. We politely and respectfully disagree with each other and we exchange viewpoints, sometimes completely 180 degrees opposed viewpoints. Yes, it was uncomfortable for me and it may be uncomfortable for you to watch. We start with Chris presenting his tricks and tips for successful foam sclerotherapy and then the debate really begins. How best to treat leg veins? At the end, I'll tell you where I stand now nearly a year later after that debate. Thank you, Haroon, for um, putting up with me and to talk more about foam sclerotherapy. This is a presentation that uh, I was asked to give at the UIP in Miami in September. Uh, this is me. These are my disclosures. I frankly think disclosures should stay up the entire time a person is speaking, so we all know what those are, but uh, none of these have uh, anything to do with my views, I think, on foam square therapy. I do think this disclosure is uh, important. I have been uh, an administrator for foam square therapy experts for uh, many years now. We're approaching 1,500 worldwide physicians. I search the world's literature on foam sclerotherapy and some other topics every day. I look at these articles. If I think they're of merit, uh, I post them and make comments. So how we do it. Uh, we do foam sclerotherapy at scale and we use mid-level providers. Uh, Physician assistants and nurse practitioners work in concert with an ultrasound technologist and can do foam sclerotherapy just as effectively as I can, and they can do it just as safe as I can. And my colleagues, uh, Rob Worthington Kirsch and President-elect of AVLS, Satish Vegala, presented um, several years ago their experience at Vein Clinics of America of uh, comparing physicians to mid-level providers and an ultrasound technologist, both uh, bas basically the effectiveness of foam. Well, actually to be more accurate, um, the safety. And there was, there was no difference. So I grouse at physicians who think that it takes years and years of experience to do foam safely and effectively. I teach uh, mid-level providers to do foam in a matter of weeks, and I can explain. So we use 1% polydocanol. We don't use compounded sclerosin. Uh, I don't work for a sclera or Kreuzler, but we use the uh, non-compounded FDA-approved sclerosant at scale. We use 0.5 uh, milliliters of 1% polydocanol mixed with 2 milliliters of room air, uh, ready to go with a three-way stopcock, and it generates 2.5 mils of foam. We typically give 10 cc's. 10 mils of foam, but we don't have a hard rule about that. We might do a little less. We might do more, depending on uh, burden of venous disease. Room air is definitively more stable than any physiologic gas, and uh, that's why we prefer to use it. I had the inauspicious duty to debate Nick Morrison, <laughs> former UIP president, AVLS president, on uh, the virtues of air foam versus phys physiologic foam at the UIP. I encourage everybody to see that debate because 
honestly, I'm sorry, but he went down an ignominious defeat. And I encourage everybody to look at it based on the data. Technique is more important to safety than how foam is made. Small repeated injections using freehand ultrasound technique, uh, in my uh, opinion, is more important than large foam aliquots using butterfly needles and, and other things. A reluctance to put a needle in a patient uh, as many times as necessary to do foam contributes to the problems with foam, the ineffectiveness of foam, uh, so-called phlebitis, and, and pigment. Those who are unwilling to poke their patients with a needle as many times as it takes are doing their patients a disservice. As an interventional radiologist, we work on uh, awake patients my entire career, we have to be pretty good at anesthesia. We never use lidocaine when we inject uh, foam through a 25 gauge needle. We simply pop through the dermis very quickly. Our nerves sit right there under the dermis. If you go in nice and slow, you will hurt people. If you pop through the skin very quickly, once you've identified your vein, using freehand technique, you will not hurt patients. We've never had anybody complain about uh, or not come back due to discomfort, certainly not from foam. It is completely well tolerated the way we do it with no anesthesia. Do not under inject. Way too many practitioners confuse uh, injecting foam with implanting foam. I'm going to quote Karosh Parsi and his team David, with David Connor in Sydney, Australia. I consider them to be foremost experts in both the clinical aspects of foam sclerotherapy and the basic science aspects of foam sclerotherapy. And Karosh talks about implanting foam. You don't inject it. And I think if you think that way, you will do much better. Unfortunately, I found many um, of those who perform foam don't understand or don't appreciate that the sine qua non of adequate foam injection is complete venous spasm. Injecting foam into a vein and watching it swirl around is not foam sclerotherapy. You must get complete venous spasm. And you must be willing to inject via multiple punctures. We don't believe in catheters or butterfly needles in our office. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just not saying, I'm just saying they're not as good as how we do it. As I previously mentioned, you have to be willing to inject, re-inject veins, and uh, have absolutely no hesitation in when you when you feel like you need to do it. We use a 25 gauge venipuncture needle. I do it freehand. I'm an interventional radiologist, so I suppose we're pretty skilled at this stuff. We have uh, a medical assistant, or really anybody. You know, it doesn't have to be someone. It could be your front desk person. We call them a foam barista. They are creating the foam for me and they hand me the 3cc Truma syringe when I'm ready so I can rapidly and readily inject the foam before I, I get in the vein. So the moment I'm ready to puncture that vein, the foam barista has the foam ready. They hand it to me, my needle's in the vein. Because I'm freehand technique, I do not aspirate. I don't need to aspirate. I can see the tip of my needle in the vein. It's not a problem. I inject, I then inject the foam. I would further say that um, I think there is uh, too much concern about extravasating foam when you use 1% polydocanol foam. I don't know about those physicians who use 1%, 3%. So Tradecol foam because they feel compelled to use much stronger concentrations of sclerosant. So I can tell you thousands and thousands of cases extravasating 1% polydocanol foam in our hands is of no consequence. Uh, you might discolor the skin temporarily or for a few days, but we have not uh, had any um, resultant uh, ulceration or tissue death problems from extravasating uh, some 1% uh, foam sclerotherapy made with room air. So I think there's some over concern for getting foam uh, extra venous when we're doing foam sclerotherapy. It's, yeah, I'm not saying be sloppy, I'm just saying it's, uh, 
it's almost a needless concern. So uh, my ultrasound techs and my physician assistants arguably do foam better and sit more safely than I do because the ultrasound technologists hold the transducer. We do a trans, we don't do a transverse approach, which we do a longitudinal approach, which I think it's good to be skilled in any method, be it axial or longitudinal when you're doing imaging guidance. But when it comes to injecting vessels, I strongly urge people to do it in the longitudinal plane. So my ultrasound, our ultrasound tech will hold over the vein, the target vein in uh, longitudinal fashion. The PA will make their own foam. They will put the needle right at the foot of the ultrasound probe and direct their needle quickly through the dermis as we teach them and into the vein. They are able to aspirate, get a little bit of blood in the hub and then inject. Um, this, uh, this works fine. I do understand that worldwide that there aren't ultrasound techs everywhere and that mid-level providers are limited through licensure and other things in, in other parts of the world, but in any case, that's what we do. Do not under-inject. You must get complete venous spasm, and that includes a perforating vein, which we routinely inject large perforating veins, close them, and we don't have uh, DVT. Two or more sessions. There are too many practitioners, Haroon, who have a, I don't know, when I was uh, in the hospital, surgeons used to say, well, you know, I'm going to fight another day. I'm sorry, I can't see your face. You know, sometimes, you know, <laughs> case, you know the surgical case, you know, would be so tough, what, they'd close them up and they'd bring them back another day. Well, I would say when it comes to foam sclerotherapy, you must fight another day. If you don't, you're doing your patients a disservice. So you must do at least two foam sessions per leg. Why? Because I don't care whether you got complete venospasm of it. Even if you got complete venospasm in every vein that you saw on day one, the next day or the next few days or a week later, you will re-ultrasound these patients because we've done it for a long, long time now and find veins that you had no idea you overlooked. It's like, what's going on? My own personal belief is that um, many veins spasm as you incrementally inject foam that you're unaware of. And you will come back the next day and be completely surprised at the number of tributaries and other veins that you meticulously overlooked the day before. That's one reason. The other reason is we we understand or we should understand that when we inject foam, Tassari published on this, it's gone in eight seconds. It's no longer biologically active. And so I find many practitioners obsess over foam in the deep system when it's not doing anything anymore. Again, the sine qua non would be spasm. I get foam in the deep veins routinely, but it doesn't lead to spasm and thus, you know, deep vein sclerosis. I'll get back to deep vein sclerosis, a, a term coined by Parsi and his group that's extremely important to cover. So you will overlook veins if you don't come back a second time. They may be in spasm. And my point about pointing out that in eight seconds the foam is gone is as you're injecting foam into a vein, you get spasm. But at some point over that eight second time period, as the foam travels, it obviously gets less and less effective because it's being simultaneously consumed by the red blood cells. So at the leading margin of your foam, and I think we all fundamentally understand this in our mind's eye, the foam isn't that effective. And Haroon, I wish I could see your face, but that includes your 3% foam, your 1% foam. I don't care what concentration you make. As it travels and over time, it becomes less and less effective. You could use 10% foam, and this concept is operative anytime you're injecting foam. So because of this, you will see veins that I fear some colleagues say, oh, wow, I see foam in the vein. I'm done. It looks great. You know, I don't need to do anymore. You will come back the next day and you will find areas that you thought 
you foamed that are perhaps not completely open, Haroon, but um, are partially closed or not completely closed. And that is the root of problems with phlebitis and pigment. People who undertreat their patients with foam scleric therapy are literally creating SVT. They're creating it. And they're getting all the results of an SVT, which is a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. Let me go on to the next uh, slide. Inject foam into partially closed veins. I've heard everything under the sun. Uh, there's so much lore, not just in medicine, you know, just because we've always done it that way. And I was told, and you know, they're, they're still telling people to make a wheel when they do lidocaine. Yeah, if you want to hurt the crap out of people, make a wheel. How about stick your needle through the dermis, injects uh, lidocaine in this a lot less, but still it's taught in medical school. Make a wheel. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done that in decades and you will hurt people less. Sorry for that digression. The need for IND in our office is extremely rare. I'm not making this up. I, I, I might have to do it once every two months because we're very aggressive at re-injecting what we term spongy veins. So when you come back the next day, the next week, the next month, okay, we inject spongy veins. Or many of us will see a filling defect in that vein. And so we will inject more foam. By golly, the best time to inject foam, arguably, is when it's partially closed and has a coagulant or filling defect in it, Haroon. Because then your foam is exclusively limited to the intima of the vein and the filling defect. I hope that makes sense. So one of the best times to inject a vein is when it's partially occluded. You can direct your foam where it needs to be because there's a filling defect already in the vein. So phlebitis is the result of partially closed veins and physicians who have this one and done, we're not going to fight another day mentality. To fully understand foam sclerotherapy, treat SVT with foam. Oh my God, that's crazy, Chris. It's not crazy. Actually, there's other practitioners who come up to me, oh, I've been doing that for years. The only difference is they're not as loud as Chris Pittman. So I so enjoy your forum, Haroon, and look forward to its future because we can share among believable high volume practitioners an advanced field of venous and lymphatic medicine on, patient, on behalf of patients worldwide. So that's right. If someone comes in with an acute or subacute or chronic SVT that is symptomatic in any way, we will inject foam into that vein. And guess what? They'll be out of pain within 24, 36 hours. This is also fundamental to understand. Intact intima on an ultrasound indicates that the vein needs more foam. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures to share, but I'm happy to do that in a follow-up. But it is pretty easy to identify on ultrasound, Haroon, an intact intima versus one that has been adequately impacted by foam. Again, I, I'm, I'm bombastic a little bit just to get people to think. Not That's it. I'm not trying to stir the pot, but you actually don't need to uh, excise a vein, look under a microscope, and do all these different things. You can actually see on ultrasound uh, whether the intima has been adequately treated with foam. And in the vast majority of partially treated veins, you will see an intact white line intima that everybody should be familiar with who does foam. So intact intima on ultrasound means more foam, please. If you kill the intima, you kill the vein. If you kill the queen bee, the entire hive dies. I'm sorry for the analogies, not all of them are good but they help me understand things. So if you injure the intima as occurs, actually with SVT, Haroon, the intima isn't injured at all. There's merely a thrombus. And the thrombus and the physiologic uh, response to thrombus and, and the whole 
act of trying to recanalize uh, that um, that clot is what hurts the patient. So what many of my colleagues do is they create SVT in this, they get in this flywheel of IND and, you know, I got to drain the vein. No, no, you need to inject more foam, please, and kill the vein. So we fight fire with fire all the time. Patients come in, oh my gosh, I, I got foam and I hurt. Great. We're going to inject more foam right into it. We're going to fight fire with fire. And by golly, the pain will resolve over a day or so, you know, with compression and possibly some non-steroidals and over-the-counter pain medicines. But this concept of if you don't, if you injure the intima, the vein may kill the patient. And by that, I mean, they're going to hurt. They're going to hurt. And if you want to, I think the best way really to understand what I've said over the last three slides is to actually inject foam into SVT. The only difference between uh, de novo off the street SVT and what we do as foam sclerotherapists is we kill the intima of the vein. And when you kill the intima of the vein, you stop the physiologic process that leads to the pain. So I'll, I'll quit beating that horse. Spongy veins are injured veins. Put them out of their misery. Sorry for the horse lovers, but the analogy we use is a horse behind the barn and we need to go put it out of its misery. Let's inject more foam into it. Next slide. Persistent pigment means partially closed veins. One of the time. Now, Persistent pigment. I hear this, oh gosh, Chris, what about phlebitis? Well, we already covered that, you know, as if it's a complication. For God's sakes, tenderness is expected after foam sclerotherapy. Again, you've got to manage your patient's expectation. You know, it's like tenderness is discomfort when you touch the leg. Pain is discomfort when you're standing around. Pain and tenderness are two completely different things. And we tell every patient, you will be tender, 100% guaranteed. It is not a complication. It is an expectation. And if you talk to your patients that way and you fully treat the vein, they won't progress to pain. So pigment works the same way. Pigment is an expectation. If a patient doesn't get pigment, you can celebrate. But I tell every patient, we want to under-promise and over-deliver. You will get tender. You will get pigment. If pigment persists or gets worse over three to four month period of time, one of the time a vein is open either beneath the pigment or beneath the vein or around the vein. Closed veins, uh, don't trust your ultrasound tech. Now I'm, I'm being provocative for fun. On ultrasound, veins can look closed all day long all day long, but they're usually not completely closed because we routinely inject foam into thermally ablated veins. Days later, weeks later, months later, and you will be shocked at the foam that goes from, that I inject at the knee in a GSV that travels Haroon all the way to the saphenofemoral junction. But your ultrasound tech is gonna tell you it's closed. So, if you want to further inform and up your game on foam sclerotherapy, look at foam as an angiographic agent, and it will teach you a lot. So if I see pigment, in our, if we see pigment in our office that is persistent or worsening, we will do a meticulous look with ultrasound. And whether I think they're closed or not, in many cases, I will inject them. And almost uniformly, I will, I will find that, well, my God, you know, the resolution, not just the resolution, but the sensitivity of ultrasound with color or gated Doppler to detect flow in these nearly completely closed veins, it just doesn't exist. The only way you'll know is if you actually inject these so-called closed veins. When you do that, your pigment will start to regress. My own basic scientist explanation for this is a water hammer effect. If you leave a closed vein, I'm sorry, an open vein above or beneath a closed one, the vein that's causing the pigment 
and in some cases, exquisite tenderness or pain, but I'm going to stick to pigment right now. These partially closed veins in and around an area of pigment, you have a water hammer effect that does not allow the white blood cells in the area to consistently or win the battle of taking the uh, hemosiderin out of there. You have this constant pressure and blood that's pushing into this area that allows hemosiderotic pigment to persist. And once you eliminate that water hammer effect, the white blood cells have a chance to take the iron away. And I would use this analogy clinically, if you will. When we see hem hemosiderotic pigment in a lower extremity, it's obviously because blood is leaking out and staining the skin and the hemosiderin deposits. But once you stop that feedback, where the deposition of iron in the tissues has overwhelmed the ability of the white blood cells to, to take that iron away, then the pigment improves. We, we all know it may not go away completely. In fact, it usually doesn't. But at least in our hands, it usually improves. So I'm using that example, Haroon, to back up the concept of persistent pigment means partially closed veins. Fancy maneuvers have no benefits, so inject patients flat. I urge anyone doing foam sclerotherapy, and unfortunately, I've been unable to find it on the internet. It's absolutely mind-blowing to me. View a real-time lower extremity venogram to broaden your appreciation of venous flow dynamics. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, may, many of us have been told, in my experience, having done countless lower extremity venograms as an old-time radiologist, we have been told things that just aren't the case when it comes to lower extremity venous hemodynamics. So I'm actually old enough to remember doing 10 lower extremity ultrasound replaced lower extremity venography in 1988, 19, when I was doing my residency. And I've done lots of venograms, you know, for other reasons. And we're bringing this in for a landing, but in order to, you basically start an IV in the back of the foot. And in order to drive venous contrast, contrast agent into the deep system, Haroon, you need to apply a very tight tourniquet at the ankle, usually below the knee, and in some cases above the knee. Otherwise, that contrast will flow preferentially in the superficial venous system. I don't think I need to get too long-winded, but when you start to understand the dynamics of a lower extremity venogram, you will be much less afraid of injecting foam. So you have to drive it into the deep system. The superficial system does not preferentially drain into the deep system. That does not comport with my experience. You have to force it in there. So I like to pay, I like to treat patients supine. Um, there are plenty of articles saying compression and elevation, all these things really don't make a whole lot of difference. Um, you know, we could argue about exsanguinating the vein uh, being a, a better situation, but again, that depends on practice context as we've talked about off video. So I'm going to point out one more physiologic thing uh, about foam sclerotherapy. Since we all agree, Haroon, that the sine qua non of adequate foam sclerotherapy is complete venospasm, then we have no difficulty understanding as we inject foam in superficial veins and foam starts to stream across perforating veins, that perforating veins will not close until they spasm, okay, by definition. So as you're injecting adequate amounts of foam in the superficial veins and it starts to stream across the perforating vein, whether you're looking at it or not, the vein will start to spasm and ultimately limit the amount of dangerous, I'm using that in quotes, foam going across the perforating vein. It's actually protective the mere act of venous spasm that occurs when you're injecting foam 
protects the deep system if you're getting adequate amounts of foam across the perforating vein. Here's where people get into trouble. And this is informed based on experience viewing real-time lower extremity and performing countless of them, lower extremity venograms. We actually do have a calf muscle pump. We actually do have sinuses in the calf. It's literally a little heart. And when you drive contrast agent into the deep system, you will see stagnant contrast-laden blood in sinuses of the calf, or so-called gastroc veins. Which is why I advise everybody to not over-inject if you're a beginner below the knee. Below the knee, do half mil aliquots of foam at a time. I think it's a good idea to activate the calf muscle pump, have the patient do that for five seconds post-injection. I won't get into the nuances, but if you want to stay out of trouble, do that. You have to do that to drive any foam that is stagnant, even for a few seconds, out of the calf muscle pump. That's why I advise that. Now, at the knee and above, inject all you want, Haroon. It doesn't matter. If you watch a lower extremity venogram, you will see the speed of flow in the femoral. You can inject enough foam. I mean, if you're really stupid and you really try hard, maybe, but even then, I kind of doubt it, honestly. <laughs> because we know that the sine qua non is complete spasm. And it's going to be hard for you to get enough foam in the fast-flowing uh, blood of the femoral popliteal and certainly the iliac system to achieve complete venous spasm, which is why you can inject two, three, four cc's anywhere above the knee and you're going to be fine. Um, <laughs> I really, I defy people to try to occlude with foam sclerotherapy the common femoral vein. You're going to have to try very, very, very hard. Because not only is the foam being consumed within eight seconds, it's not reaching a critical mass to achieve venous spasm. It's being diluted. And that's why, you know, you can inject you know, in the in the great saphenous vein and not have to worry about sclerosis occurring, you know, beyond the saphenofemoral junction. It just isn't going to happen unless you're, I, I don't know, it just has never happened with us. And we inject with impunity above the knee, several cc's at a time, no big deal. Again, if you watch a venogram, Haroon, these things will become obvious, I think, to everybody. I also wanted to, at this time, pivot a little bit to all of Karosh Parsi and David Connor's work. Their papers are all worth uh, reading. Parsi and Connor uh, talk about deep vein occlusion. They looked at nearly 10,000 cases over six years and found a deep vein occlusion rate of two. They subjected these deep vein occlusion. They didn't call it clot, clot or deep vein thrombosis. They didn't call it deep vein sclerosis. They called it occlusion. They subjected these patients to D-dimer, to a, a D-dimer test, and determined that the number of DVTs was based on positive D-dimer. And Deep vein sclerosis was two out of a deep vein occlusion rate of two. So the vast majority of so-called DVT that they found, mostly in the calf veins, as we've already covered, Haroon, was actually not DVT. It's a very interesting term, deep vein sclerosis. So they used up to 21 milliliters of foam was used per session. So I would... I would say that the rate of D actually in their in their clinic the rate of DVT is so low that they don't do ultrasound follow up anymore. I mean, this is a seminal paper in my opinion. It should inform all of us that foam is not as dangerous as most people make out to be. They are under injecting their patients. Um, they needn't do that. And and I would I guess I will conclude with this. Well, one more thing. Extravasating 1% foam safer than 1.5 and 3. So Tradecol, Verathene FDA approved in this country is 1% polydocanol. It works fine. And honestly, all of this 
concentration stuff begs the question, given patient reported outcomes, and it doesn't matter whether the veins closed in the end anyway, um, as we've talked about uh, in the past. I think many people are probably over-treating, no matter who does the treatment, me, you, anybody in the world, one and done is never going to completely uh, treat that patient 100%. I don't care if you're doing glue. I don't care if you're doing thermal. You're going to have some failure. And the ultimate safety net is foam sclerotherapy. So you've got to be willing to, to see these patients uh, again and create uh, a masterpiece. All right. Thank you, Haroon. Oh, these are some aphorisms. Let's have a little fun. All the do dog stuff. Friends don't let friends get vein surgery. There's no role for surgery in vein care. Once a vein patient, always a vein patient. This notion of I'm going to do some high reimbursing procedures and discard you as a patient to live in compression the rest of your life is harmful, dishonest, and uh, it's not right to tell any patient that. One and done vein treatment is a myth. Uh, at least in Florida, if veins were roaches, most practitioners spray roaches they see, but with foam, we are going to fumigate your leg. So we're going to get a better, more comprehensive outcome that I hope to prove over the next year or two with the substantial data we've collected by fumigating your leg with foam. We need to drop F-bombs on you for the rest of your life. Um, you know, joke, fun, whatever, but that's what we tell every patient. You will need F-bombs dropped on you periodically for the rest of your life to maintain your leg health. Patients care if they feel better, not if their veins remain closed. Going to the vein doctor once in a lifetime makes as much sense as going to the dentist once in a lifetime. Not a good idea. You remember this, Haroon, as a surgeon, the procedure was a technical yeah. success. The patient died. So the... Vein proceduralist version might be, if they care to think about it, by God, my laser was a technical success, or my RF, or my glue, or pick something. But the question, I don't care who does it and what they use, the patient's quality of life will gradually deteriorate. And if I don't do foam, Haroon, I have no treatment option to help my patient in the future. Everybody needs to think deeply about that. Only foam ultrasound guided foam can meet the needs of our patients over their lifetime. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Well, it's, uh, it's a privilege to see your UIP presentation, which was in Miami in September. And uh, we're very lucky to, to have you present it to us and with more detail. So, Chris, just a couple of, a few questions I've been asked to put to you. What is your schedule. If you have a patient with vein disease, do you have a set schedule? Would you see these patients the next day, the next week, the next month? In general, do you have a follow-up schedule? That's an excellent question. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is no. I don't, there's lore out there again that, oh my God, you have to wait six weeks between foam sclerotherapy or XYZ, which is complete poppycock in my opinion. We'll see patients as soon as the next day for their second session of foam. Typically, patients come back in a week or two weeks. I don't like to go beyond three weeks when I started a foam sclerotherapy treatment protocol, Haroon, because of what I just covered. I will inevitably leave some veins partially treated that could lead to um, exquisite tenderness or pain. So. In our office, we don't like to go beyond three weeks. We will sometimes, but if a patient's, we try to get foam done, the average patient's going to take two sessions and we try to get it done within three weeks, but we have no hard and fast rules and it's not dangerous. And if, you know, if the patient goes for six weeks and, you know, has a little tenderness or pain or, or whatever. But it can be as soon as the next day. But I would say in our offices, um, some patients want to knock it out in several days and some patients, it's, it's basically every week or two. And am I right in thinking that you would treat truncal reflux first or at least include it in the first session? 
And if you can't treat everything in one session, you would then go on to the tributaries. Yes, it's fundamental, I think, for all of us to treat the truncal reflux first, and that's what we'll do. Now, um, it's important that, you know, we understand the, the reimbursement systems in different countries. So in this, in this country, payers don't want me to do things quickly. And so you accuse me just for fun of, you know, doing too many treatments with my patients. But in our system, they want us to do things on different days. They don't want us to do everything on one day. They don't want that. Right. I won't get into the policy reasons for that. So, um, uh, so in, in, in any case, we get the trunk, trunk first with thermal which I need to check that box, quite frankly, to stay in business because the Medicare reimbursement is about a Medicare. My, the, fo the foam treatment's only about $300. So I'll go out of business right. in my country very quickly if I just do foam. Right. Let me point out that if okay. someone comes in, wants to pay me cash, I will do all of it with foam. I told you I treated my my brother-in-law with nothing but foam. And he lives in Cabo Lucas, Mexico, fly it out the same day. So I will do, it usually takes me two, maybe three sessions to completely treat a leg with foam sclerotherapy, depending on venous burden. So in general, you would treat truncal reflux mm -hmm. with thermal ablation. And what we're talking about really then is foam sclerotherapy for non-truncal reflux or tributaries. But in, so in the case of your brother-in-law, you were able then to treat everything by foam. You treated the truncal reflux as a priority, and yes. then you treated the tributaries, whether it be in the first session or whether it be in se uh, subsequent sessions. And in between sessions, do you apply compression? Well, I, let, let, me, let, me go back, let me go back a little bit. We start, we do the French method from the top. We'll generally treat the GSV yes. from the knee to the thigh, and then the branch veins. We'll bring them back the next day. We'll go below the knee and then the back of the leg. That would be a, a typical treatment plan. When we do thermal, most patients are refluxing below the knee. We will foam the GSV between the ankle and the knee routinely. So right. I wanted to point right. that out. We'll do that pretty routinely. So as far as uh, post foam treatment. We also think it's lore to put people on treadmills and tell them to walk 30 minutes a day and all these kinds of different things. The foam is gone in eight seconds. What damage has occurred has occurred. We do recommend them to be in thigh high compression hose uh, during the day only. They don't have to wear it overnight. We don't do eccentric compression. Uh, we tell them to maintain activity or step it up so they can ride a bike, Pilates, play tennis, uh, play golf, as long as they're, they, they can go to, you know, a football game, as long as they're in their compression hose. On the other hand, right. if people don't want to wear compression, can't wear compression, because some older people just can't do it, it's not a crime to perform foam or thermal ablation with no compression. Now, Oh. I think for for the foam sclerotherapists among us, I can I think we would mostly agree that patients will have less discomfort or less tenderness if they wear hose. And what we will do sometimes, Haroon, is if they have uh, a heavy venous burden, the big knots all over the legs, I will tell them to wear two hose on one leg, two twenty to thirties. It nearly doubles the compression. The yeah. Two twenty. The second pair of hose. Oh my God, Doctor Pivot, How could we possibly do that? Well, it's actually much easier to get the second pair of hose on than the first one, and we feel we feel like um, when people double down on compression like that, they will get out of it sooner and they will recover faster. We've just found that anecdotally, yes. and I will yeah. recommend that to those patients who can tolerate it, who have a heavy burden of you know gnarly, knotty. Uh, varicose veins, but there are, there are very esteemed practitioners in, in our country that never use never use compression after foam, and they might get a little more tenderness and pigment. They manage the expectations; the patients do fine. Okay, 
So you will put them in hosiery, but no bandaging, no eccentric compression, and it's about 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury ankle pressure. Sometimes you'll have two sets of hosiery, so you're aiming for 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury at the ankle. Yes. Let, let, and they, yes. Wear it, they wear it during the day, take it off at night, Yes. and if they don't wear it, it's not, not a problem. You're, it's not, you're, a problem. I mean, not a problem. Let me quote some literature, as you're probably aware. They've done MRIs and CT scans of patients yeah. in thigh high compression. Yeah. They found that the compression on the GSV above the knee is de minimis at best. And so I would challenge those eccentric compression people. Um, maybe we need to do a CT or MRI on that to prove it doesn't make much of a hill of beans a difference, but I digress. Okay. All right. That's good. And just to clarify, so I'm understanding you correctly, when you talk about incision and drainage, are you talking about a scalpel or are you talking about a needle aspiration? Oh, heavens, no, not a scalpel, not as an intervention radiologist. No, I'm, I'm messing around. Um, I'm talking about if, if we do an incision and drainage, which is the term we need to use in order to be paid for, to do it, um, I, use an, I use an 18 gauge venipuncture needle. And you're saying that's fewer than 5% cases you do that? Absolutely. You talk to my staff and they will all attack okay. you, sir. All right. Okay. Don't undertreat your patients. I know I'm being. <laughs> No, 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 no. I we think, I under, think, um, they're patients. Uh, no, the thing is, the thing is, Chris, I need to understand what you're doing. So I have to ask some clarifying questions oh. before I really make any comments. So Dream that's up. really the purpose. Yeah. And people mean different things when they say, in, when you talk to a surgeon and you say incision and drainage, yeah. I mean, for me, that's a catastrophe. I would, yes. I have never seen anybody yes. require an incision or drainage. Yes. I, Nothing's I, gone septic. There's no, there's no pus. There's no, no. Uh, there's no collection I'm, of any. Yeah. I'm simply liberating coagulum in those few patients right. that develop pain or exquisite tenderness, or in some cases, pigment. And I just want them to get better sooner because many of our patients live half naked here in Florida. They're very body conscious. So again, I'm going to allege, you know, we see runway models and um, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to tolerate. Okay. Mm -mm. All right. Okay. Now let me, sh if I hope I can, I've got a little presentation for you, Chris. All right. And I hope, for, for I, hope I can share there, it. Haroon uh, sprung this on ah, you. Here we go. It is, I'm happy. That's all right. No, 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 no. Okay. Let's have a look. Uh, oh, here we go. Kilo. It's not really. It's not really for you to. Uh, it's not really to spring on you. It's just for discussion. I'm having. Really. I'm having uh, some fun. We, we got to have some fun. We don't want to be too. We stupid. gotta have. Like like. No, this is this is this is this is just for fun. I don't want to be too fun. British. <laughs> Hey, come on, Chris. You can't be British. <laughs> did, did I ever tell you? Oh, please allow me to digress because people think uh, whatever. But um, I do like to have fun. My favorite British cut down was this. <laughs> Haroon, I, I shouldn't like to tell you that you are completely wrong, but I would, I would no. like to tell you that I am completely right. That was a British insult I heard years ago that I think is just beautiful. I had to yeah. share it. The guy wasn't willing to tell, tell the other guy he was uh, completely wrong, but he was willing to tell him that he, he was completely right. Anyways, sorry for that. Here's the thing. I'm going to talk you through what I think. Chris. There's a lot of uncertainty about the treatment of veins. Uh, a lot of the studies are poor quality. A lot of the Absolutely. reviews are, are reviews of poor quality studies. And I think there's a lot we don't know. So. In fact, as a consultant, seeing a patient in front of me, I have to acknowledge that I don't know best. We have to say there are lots of uncertainties, but there are guidelines and there are guidelines which we're obliged to share with the patient as part of the consent process. Otherwise, there's a danger that we might be viewed as being paternalistic. I know best. I'm going to impose this treatment on you. Uh, what I do is I tell them what the guidelines are. And in the United Kingdom, there are nice guidelines which say that for truncal reflux, consider thermal ablation first. If a thermal ablation is not possible, consider ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy. 
And if neither of those are possible, consider surgery. Now, as a surgeon, I don't think there's any place for surgery, and I don't consider ambulatory phlebectomy as surgery. I, I consider it as an adjunctive procedure. But indeed it is surgery. It's a cosmetic adjunctive surgery. surgery. The phlebectomy is there. No, it's, no if, you don't, if you don't deal with all the tributaries, you run the risk of it's, um, you, persistent reflux. It's not, it's not on its own a cosmetic procedure. There's it's absolute, part of treating the tributary. There's absolutely no, no I, clinical data to back that let up. Me, let, let, <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me develop the argument a little bit, Chris. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that I would do phlebectomy alone. I think the characterization of phlebectomy as being a cosmetic procedure is, I think, wrong because most of us would do phlebectomy in association with foam sclerotherapy. Very few of us now would do an endothermal ablation for trunk reflux and phlebectomy alone. We understand that we're not treating the whole venous system. I have a rule which says, and this is my strategy, proposed strategy, that if it's straight and deep, that is if it's in the saphenous fascia, I will treat it by endothermal ablation. If it's deep and tortuous, I will treat it with ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy. And if it's superficial, if it's palpable, I will treat it by a combination of foam sclerotherapy and phlebectomy. Because I think that is the quickest, most effective way of treating tributaries once the main saphenous trunk has been dealt with by thermal ablation. It's not a once and done procedure. I think foam is complementary to phlebectomy and phlebectomy is complementary to foam. And I think if you treat very large tributaries by foam, and yes, you can treat large tributaries by foam, you will have the issue of persistent thrombus, persistent pain and pigmentation, which can be shortened, if not short circuited completely if you do phlebectomy and foam sclerotherapy. So it's not just a cosmetic procedure. The fact that it's done in a cosmetically acceptable way through very small little uh, punctures in the skin is to improve the outcome for the patient because a lot of them don't want their legs to be disfigured by surgical scars, such that we used to do before. And in my practice, it, at least it used to be, the combination of endothermal foam sclerotherapy and phlebectomy was the norm. I would always, it would be very rare for me not to treat a patient without foam. And I expected chronic venous disease is not lifelong, is, is wrong, and I agree with you entirely. In my clinic, we offered patients annual review, take a history, re-examine them, and treat any recurrences or any symptomatic disease with foam sclerotherapy, because I think foam is ideally suited to the follow-up and to the, to the vein care. And I agree with you, if you don't do foam, you're not providing comprehensive uh, vein care. So on the day of treatment, I would stand the patient up and I would mark all the tributaries that were palpable with an indelible pen. I would then lie the patient down on the day of treatment, scan their leg and mark the course of the saphenous reflux and any tributaries which I can't see or feel with the patient standing up. And the aim would be, at the time of treatment, would be to treat anything that's straight and deep by endothermal ablation, and any tributaries by a combination of foam sclerotherapy. Foam to the deeper tributaries that I can't see or feel, and phlebectomy to the tributaries that I can feel and see. And the results are quick. I would propose to you that they're quicker than having people uh, treated solely by foam sclerotherapy. And in fact, I don't think there's much difference, Chris, because once you've explained the context in which your practice operates, it's clear that the patients get endothermal ablation and then they get foam sclerotherapy. But if you're going to leave out anything, I would agree, phlebectomy is the thing to leave out. I think the characterization that some of us use butterflies to dump large amounts of foam into a vein is wrong. I think most of us will use cannulas and butterflies to access the vein at multiple points, both the trunk 
and the tributaries. And we would use that uh, to, to be able to implant foam into the veins, sometimes with the leg elevated, not because of hemodynamic considerations, but because we know that elevating the leg reduces the diameter of the vein. And so a given volume of foam will travel further in the vein. So it reduce the amount of foam required to treat all the veins. And like you, I think having a barista is a good idea. Once we place the cannulas, uh, my assistant would make the foam by the Tassari method in exactly the same way that you described. My practice has been to use higher concentrations of STS than you've described, but I think you make a valid point, and I think we probably ought to consider reducing the concentration. I think the purpose of the of this foam is to cause endothelial destruction. Um, and as you say, that's accomplished within a few seconds of the injection. We want complete endothelial destruction over a sufficient length of vein to get occlusion of that vein. We don't want little islands of endothelium which can recanalize. And the purpose of, of uh, compression is to limit the amount of thrombus formation. Thrombus is going to form, I agree, inevitably after foam sclerotherapy. But if you can apply eccentric compression, I think you're going to limit that. And my protocol would be to see patients every two weeks. I nearly always aspirate. I would say my aspiration rate is 50%. Nearly everybody has a lumpy, tender area. Uh, and if I aspirate with a, with a needle, I can evacuate that clot. And then I would re-inject course and that would be the routine i would see the person every two weeks rescan aspirate inject until such time as i couldn't see any more uh, tender lumpy areas and i couldn't see any varicose veins and the vein appeared occluded on the scan now i take your point that often the vein is not totally occluded i have to say i haven't been really paying attention to the intima, I'm not sure I could actually identify intact intima, and that hasn't been my practice previously to look for intact intima. I would just aspirate and re-inject every two weeks. And I, like you, I would treat one leg at a time. And I would say it would be an average of three, four visits every two weeks to complete one leg and then turn my attention to the other leg. And I do like eccentric compression because I agree with you. Hosiery is not going to occlude the vein. I don't know what the purpose of, of hosiery after foam sclerotherapy is, but I suspect it's an anti-inflammatory effect that it has, and it improves lymphatic flow. Perhaps in that way, it reduces the pain and improves the healing process. But I have found anecdotally that applying eccentric compression under a brandage with a stocking over the top and wearing it for three to five days continuously seems to give better results. I do, like you, say to them it's going to hurt, and I do expect them to have brown, lumpy areas. Uh, that's a given, really. But it's reduced if you can pull out the big veins and limit the amount of thrombus formation that way because you're not leaving residual veins with clot in them. Um, that was a quick romp through what I do, Chris. I don't think, to be honest, there's much disagreement. I understand your context now, and now that I understand your context, I can see why your focus is on foam sclerotherapy. Most of us, certainly in this country anyway, would not have uh, mid-level providers. We wouldn't have an ultrasound technician. Personally, I like to use the transverse way of scanning. I have the scanner in one hand, my left, and I use a butterfly for four main reasons. Uh, I like to see the needle in the vein on ultrasound, of course. I like to see non-pulsatile dark blood in the cannula. I like to aspirate the blood and then flush it with saline. There's no dead space before I inject, before I inject the foam. I do agree that Terumo syringes are best. Terumo are terrific. BD syringes are bad. That's how I tend to remember it. I think you get better foam. I'm not sure if it really makes a lot of difference once it's injected, but I use Teremo syringes like you do. And I would inject in the same way that you do, multiple injections uh, to get complete spasm. If I couldn't, if I was limited by the volume of sclerosa that I could use, I would fill the truncal veins. I do like cannula. I do use a bleb of a little bit of local anesthetic. 
when I'm putting in a vent flon or a abacath vent, I like to tape everything down. I used to elevate the leg. I don't do that anymore. I don't think it makes a lot of difference. But I understand why others do, to reduce the diameter of the vein and reduce perhaps the amount of sclerosin that they use, need to, to fill all these veins. But my context is different. I don't think I could persuade people to come back every 24 hours. I don't think I could... I don't have a scheduling system that would allow me to have an ad hoc way of doing things the way that you're able to do. I would need to have a system where I could say, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. When one leg's finished, we then go on to the other leg. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. But other than that, I understand your context. Um, I don't think that context applies to a lot of us, but I understand that you are looking at scale. You're looking at the greatest benefit to as many people as possible, and that's why you use foam sclerotherapy. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I don't disagree with it at all. I think what we're perhaps discussing is just things around the periphery, because you do endothermal ablation and you do foam sclerotherapy. I have no problem with that. I'm just telling you why I do what I do. And Chris, I haven't seen you so quiet for so long. Oh, I'm just lots to say, but I, I won't say it. Um... Why How not? many? It's shocking. It's shocking the number of practitioners. A lot of great foam work has been done in your country, and it is shocking uh, that even among luminary vein physicians, that they don't realize the Everett trial that Davies and um, Goel, Manj Goel, published in the arguably the most respected journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine in May 20, that fully two to one of those patients in that study were treated exclusively with foam sclerotherapy. <laughs> most people don't know that because they, I guess they don't read the entire article. I want to point something else out because what I'm responding to, what, I, what I'm trying to accomplish, not just the scale, is to eliminate the boogeyman aspects of foam sclerotherapy is as if it's dangerous and it takes years of experience, which is all BS, if people just follow some of the concepts I've, I've shared here today. And some of the papers that have done been done by Parsi and others showing how incredibly safe it is. But here's another thing. I'm going to bring some policy and politics into this. If you're just reading abstracts and conclusions, by God, you're missing the boat. So I'll call call her out because it's true. There's a physician, Julie Brittenden, who has published uh, every five years or so, maybe three installments since 2009, a comparison between surgery, thermal ablation, and foam. Are you aware of her work? No, not really, no. Okay. Tell well, me about it. It gets a lot of press because it's done every five years and, you know, so on and so forth. Well, oh, yeah, I think. And they, and yeah. You know, what most articles do is, oh, well, see the old, see the other article to see how we did this, you know, because it's under the auspices of, you know, very fancy academic and, you know, NHS kind of stuff and grants and this is and that. And yeah, yeah. here's where I'm going, here's where I'm going with this is if you look back at the original article, which I believe is in 09, and you dig down deep, okay, this is the politics and the BS that exists to the yeah. detriment of patients. If you dig down in the appendix of that initial article yeah. and you look at how the arms of this study was were done, ladies and gentlemen, they compare thermal ablation and foam to foam sclerotherapy. So in the thermal ablation arm, they allowed the practitioner to do adjuvant or you know additional foam over and above just thermal ablation and compared it to those who did nothing but foam. I'm sorry, that's dishonest. And that is, it's completely dishonest. And in the article, mm. you know, the, yeah. the, the, the title says something. Oh, well, foam's not quite so good. Well, no, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you're comparing foam with thermal and foam. Completely dishonest. Yeah. Buried deep, yeah. deep, deep, deep into the original article. And, and it's that kind of stuff that lights a fire under me around the world because this kind of stuff's happening all over the world. 
France. Oh my gosh, uh, you should talk to them. What's going on with, you know, characterizing foam as poisonous and killing people? I'm not exaggerating. You should talk to some of their French colleagues. It's all politics. It's all about the almighty dollar. It has nothing to do with what's beneficial for patients. And so I just thought I would digress, digress a little bit. Anyway, um, where do you want to go no, from I think, here? Th just because you've got a Swiss army knife, doesn't mean you can't use a hammer or a drill if it's if it's there. Yes, I I am a great enthusiast of foam sclerotherapy. There isn't probably not a vein you can't treat with foam sclerotherapy. It is the Swiss Army knife, there's no doubt. But if you've got a hammer and something needs a hammer, then hammer it. Use your Swiss I, Army knife as well. I, I don't see. I fundamentally disagree. You can operate on pancreatitis, which is, you know, is one of the most risky operations you can do if you want your patient to survive. But I can percutaneously drain and debride that pancreas in, in an awake patient, and that patient is likely to live. So I don't agree. You can... Uh, no, well... You the, can hammer, take the, hammer is endothermal, the hammer is endothermal ablation. What the about endothermal ablation is the hammer, Chris. I'm not suggesting we should then go back to surgical okay. stripping. I no, I, I agree. Like, really no, 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 no. I still no, I'm disagree. About, I'm talking, about, I'm talking I, about ambulatory phlebectomy. I'm talking about ambulatory okay. phlebectomy. That, 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 ambulatory that, phlebectomy through a, through a one millimeter incision removes a big, chunky vein. It, well, it, yeah. it's not. It's yes, you can treat it with foam. You don't. You don't need it. We we went through. I lived this through this for decades. They laughed at um, Charles' daughter who dilated an artery in the '60s with a with a with a tube. You know, I watched vascular surgeons laugh at me doing stents and angioplasty, and then they felt compelled to learn how to do it in the 2000s doing residencies. And I predict publicly into the world right now that in the future, phlebectomy will die and it's going to go away. We're in a transitional stage. It's unnecessary. It's been around for thousands of years. Name any other procedure that's been around since Hippocrates that we continue to do. Look, I'm going to be provocative about it. I've lived through this. We used to operate on pancreases. We debride them. We used to operate on abscesses. We drain them now. I mean, countless things. We used to, and, and just because you're good at doing it doesn't mean it should be done. I know some of the most talented cardiovascular, uh, cardiac surgeons anybody could ever meet, but they're all you know, they've gone out of business because of the minimally invasive technology that cardiologists have today. We're in a transitional period, Haroon. I'm just going to be prescient well, on that. Okay. It will die. I think, look. It's been grandfathered. That, I think, I think there, I, is, there is okay, no that's, meaningful that's, literature to back it up. Not ambulatory phlebectomy. I'm talking about... Small nicks in the skin to remove those huge veins underneath the skin, in combination with foam sclerotherapy. That's what I'm, and that's the, that's that's only area. That's the only area in which we disagree, and it's I, I not would, a big deal, Chris. Get, 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 I, I, I think don't think we need to fall out over that one. <laughs> I do, I do, and I'll tell you why. Because when you okay. don't avail yourself of a hammer, you get better with the Swiss Army it's, knife. And so you're you're diluting other practitioners' experience by having them continue to do phlebectomy when they could be getting better at foam. But we've had your advice on foam. We're already better at foam, Chris. Now, hey, this is a thing I don't want to fall out with you, so I'm just going to leave that one and pass no, it. Somewhere. Just where I falling. where I just okay fat because okay. no one's going to take my position. Everybody's just going to let it go, <laughs> and I'm All not. Right. You, you, I'm going to let it go, and I'm going to say: Is there any size of tributary you would, you are concerned about treating with foam? The answer is no, isn't it? No. You if can I treat wanted any to big cluster, treat any any size vein. Foam. If you want, if you want to do right. some eccentric internal compression with with saline or tumescent, then do it. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, here's a thing that I do feel strongly about. Injecting veins with superficial vein thrombosis. Now, oh, I take, I make, I personally, okay, <laughs> here's the, the distinction I make. Mm. I expect phlebitis, i.e. an inflammation in the vein after foam spirotherapy, because you've removed the endothelium. And that's essential as part of the healing process. You've, in, you've provoked an inflammatory condition, which will ultimately lead to fibrosis and obliteration of the vein. That's a given. But if somebody comes off off the street with superficial vein thrombosis, there's no way I'm going to inject foam into that. And I'll tell you why. That person is in a hypercoagulable state. SVT uh, is also a risk factor for DVT. And if in the unfortunate case that that patient were to suffer a complication from their SVT, and I've just injected foam into the leg, who is going to come looking after me, Chris? The lawyers or the medical defense unions or my medical registration? I think it's madness to inject SVT with foam. No, if you want it fully... Why would you under do that? Aspirate, and yes, because, and apply because, compression. Because, because in wait three months to treat a suffering patient, I've had patients come in suffering with daily, almost constant discomfort from SVT for months that I was able to resolve overnight when I foamed it. Well, that's anecdotal. Why would I, I'd like why, to see why would I do that? So let me, let me, you're, you're I, going too fast here. I don't know, Chris. I mean, that, that, look, that, well, that seems to me to be complete and utter madness. No, They're in a hypercoagulable the, state. They may, they may have an underlying malignancy. You're thinking, They've got, hang on. How do you know they're hypercoagulable? Did you do what Parsi and his group do we, and get a, we, a D dimer? You don't know that they're hypercoagulable. It doesn't mean I treat them that day. Soup. I'm going to do a careful ultrasound. Soup. I'm going to look at both legs. I'm going to exclude DVT, and then I'm going to foam it. If they're straight off the street and you haven't done anything to them like foam, that's a superficial vein thrombosis. To call it superficial vein phlebitis or superficial thrombophlebitis is incorrect. The primary pathology is thrombosis in the superficial vein. But what are you afraid of? Phlebitis. But what I'm are afraid, you afraid of the patient getting, I'm afraid of the SVT extending and it propagating into the deep vein and a pulmonary embolus. That could occur without foam. And I don't want to be the person who's just injected foam into okay. SVT. <laughs> then I you know what I'll aspirate, do. aspirate a tender vein and I'll put eccentric compression and a compression stocking and give them topical anti-inflammatories or oral anti-inflammatories but there's no way I'm going to pick up a syringe of foam and inject it into that vein. That's you're, that you're, I do vehemently look, we, disagree with. And you can say anecdotally you do it and they're better and colleagues do the same or you know people. Who do. But I want to see publications on that because I've not seen it. And I, I, you if, haven't published, I have you, Chris, on that? Time, we, will, we will publish it, but there'll still be holdouts. It really doesn't matter. Let let me you know it's it's that things aren't as, as simple as you, you make them. Simple. Well, you. I'm going. No, I'm no, going. they're not. They're not simple. But I'm, I think the concept of, fa of fighting fire with fire yeah. is is to people who are not informed is yeah. particularly un, unhelpful. No, in, incorrect. If you you have to treat partially closed veins, why can't you get? Uh, why aren't we creating DVT all day long in pulmonary embolism doing foam scleroid therapy, Haroon? You, 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 I there's think there's a distinction between after. No, there's a distinction between what happens after a treatment with foam scleroid therapy mm -hmm. and a person de novo coming off the street the with a primary what diagnosis of superficial. The difference is that. In one case, you you expect thrombosclerosis in the vein after foam sclerotherapy. In the second group, the primary pathology is S, is superficial vein thrombosis, not endothelial destruction. You made the point yourself that in many cases of superficial vein thrombosis, the endothelium is intact. Why yeah. would you add foam sclerotherapy to that problem? Aspirate the thrombosis and treat it with anti-inflammatories. That, well, then investigate me... the patient for the patient may not have reflux.
the patient may have an underlying malignancy. The patient may have a primary coagulopathy. The primary Allow problem me. is the clot within the vein. Allow me, if you will. I don't do it on the spot. I do rule out <laughs> occult malignancies in these kinds of things. It's not like within five minutes of meeting a patient, I inject foam in their SVT. So let's clear that up immediately. But I'm not right. going to let them suffer for weeks without doing foam sclera therapy. For, you know, first, so let me, let me say one other thing. You know, by your own admission, it is, if you sclerose the intima of the vein, you're going to tighten <laughs> the vein around the thrombus. But if it really bothers you, Haroon, this is something else that I do. If I'm really concerned that perhaps, you know, some big, you know, snake-like clot is going to go out of the GSV and into the lungs, I will thermally ablate acute thrombus. No big deal. Interventional radiologist. Do you, anti <laughs> do, you anti do you cover it with anticoagulation? Maybe. But I want you to hear what I Maybe. said. I want everybody else to hear what I said. If you're concerned that that clot's going to exit the GSV, then thermally ablate the GSV near the junction and then fall. I do it. Well, it, works. It, me of a, it reminds me of a case that I had where a patient was scheduled for endothermal ablation, foam sclerotherapy and phlebectomy. And on the day of the procedure, I diagnosed superficial vein thrombosis. And I canceled the procedure and anticoagulated the patient and rescheduled the procedure. Was that wrong? I think there are unknowns here, Chris, that the literature doesn't help us with. And I have to say, I didn't know what to do. It was totally unexpected. I scanned, as I say, I scanned them on the day and I found superficial vein thrombosis. I canceled the procedure. It's, it's okay. I am merely using SVT. Don't want to scare anybody. I'm using SVT as a way to understand what we do when we perform foam sclerotherapy. The only difference between the two, and some may argue, you know, D-dimers up or it's not up, and that would be an interesting study, right? We can, we'll do mm, that. I yeah. tell you what, I'll pledge right here between God and the world. Uh, we're going to start to do some D-dimers in, in my office, and we will get a, a case study of this. Doesn't mean that people are going, going to change it, but um, I would say this, you're right, there's Get back to the beginning. There's a lot of extremely poor literature out there. It's embarrassing if I were a full-time academic. I, I, I'm I, just going to say it with the poor articles out there. But that's what, again, I'm excited about your group and what you're doing and, and real experts who do high volume uh, vein treatment, see many patients who do a lot of foam. Expert, do not discount expert opinion. Do not discount it. No. We're never going to do the study on whether a parachute works or not, right? We've all heard that no. joke. Yeah. So, so yeah. don't, you know, we can't randomize control clinical trial everything, okay? Or we're never going to help a patient. So there's data and then there's data. But expert opinion, yeah. most of these guidelines are based on expert opinion or, or, or so on. So don't discount the experience no. of you and me and all the other folks, you know, in vain experts, I really think we have the opportunity to define, better define standards uh, of, of how we approach foam sclerotherapy to the benefit of our patients in a more granular way than these broad things, you know, that yeah. honestly aren't helpful to the everyday foam sclerotherapist. So I'm excited about yeah. that. And we can, you know, we do publish some things and, and we do research in my office, but mark my words, I think I told you this on public on, on foam sclera therapy experts. The reason I left academic medicine 30 years ago and nothing's changed is because every article no. ends with we think we know something, but we need to do a randomized controlled clinical trial. We don't need to do a yes. randomized clinical trial necessarily. But if we collect your data, my data, maybe I convince you to thermal yeah. or, or one, of your, uh, one of your members to foam an SVT, we can get a body of, of literature that's meaningful yeah. 
to our patients, meaningful. Yeah. You know, you made a, a comment earlier, you know, nothing's perfect. You know, it depends on what no. you define as, as perfect. You know, uh, again, we, we have to agree that technically whether a vein is 100% closed at a year or not doesn't matter, not according to the literature. We have well, to, we do have to again, be very careful about our terms. Yeah, we do. I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah, we, we we're going to do this in an hour. But hey, Chris, what I like, I like talking to you because you stir, you do stir the pot and you do excite some discussion. But it's just amazing. But lastly, if you had a really big Cephalus vein, like I'm talking about 15, 20 millimeters, are you going to foam that? I have. My preference. Would you, uh, would you do? My, my preference would be thermal first and then foam. Right. Okay. I, don't, but, I think we're done, Chris, because look, there's nothing. It doesn't mean foam can't be done in a 30 millimeter vein. It doesn't mean it won't work. It doesn't mean it's dangerous. You know, if you had your preference, probably, but at scale to meet the needs of patients worldwide, foam is completely safe and effective. Yes, I agree. Vein. I agree. I think, I think if you're talking about scale and you're talking about worldwide, and you're talking yeah. about the context of your clinic, which is mid-level mid providers, I think what you're doing is fantastic. And I think it's a model for the future. Most of us in the UK, we're solo practitioners. We might be possibly in a group of two or three others, but we don't have access to texts to hold the scanner for us, hold the ultrasound probe. Some of us will have a barista, some of us won't. The context is different. And I think that's where the differences occur. On sure. technique, I'm with you 100%, Chris, except can SVT. I, can I, sorry, can I, I, I don't feel comfortable. Oh, oh, good. I've really found a, found a, a, you found, a the, you found the little tender spot. Love you it, found love the phobitic point. Yes. Aspirate um, it. Don't inject add, more foam, please. Well, we'll, we'll see about that. But anyways, um, All right, then. I wanted to ask you hey, what Chris, you're doing. How long does it take you to do foam the way you do it with all that? Is it a 30-minute encounter, 45 minutes, one hour? What, what do you a allow? 40, we weren't a high-volume practice. We were a high-quality, high high-revenue practice with low throughput. We provided a um, high-ticket item. We weren't looking at volume. We weren't looking at... Uh, I was looking at a high-ticket service. So it was a 45-minute appointment always with a chaperone, always with a barista, get yeah. undressed in privacy, all the pleasantries that go along with a consultant offering a high ticket item, uh, help with putting the stockings on. I did the bandaging myself. I put the eccentric compression on myself. I helped the person on with the stocking. I thanked them. I waved goodbye, to escort them off the premises, shook their hands and see them every and two weeks until they're done. But that's a different context, you see. I mean, you'd be, okay. yeah. Different context. You're, you're like a Savile Row uh, tailor, and I might be more like a Macy's. Well, uh, no, no. I was. I would say I was the waitress. I wasn't the, um, you know, the, the big London stores. But I was providing something a bit more than Tesco or Walmart. You know, I was a bit more up more correct. market. And, and, not and, suggesting and, your Walmart. Please forgive me. I didn't want to suggest that at all. But that's I what understand. it was. It was a forty-five minute appointment. So I better go now. I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm going to download so and put it on we, Chris. Thank you. No, thank you. We thank you, you for being an active. We owe you a debt of gratitude. Please keep up the good work. When believable people can share among themselves and do, you know, uh, tasteful disagreement, that's how we all get better. That's how we help our patients. Yeah. So you have a yeah. very yeah. believable group of people. We need to keep meeting, sharing, um, and we will yeah. Uh, yeah. improve things for our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Enjoy. Is it Thanksgiving weekend there? It's Thanksgiving weekend. Yes. Happy yeah, Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you for giving up your time. A lot of, a lot of people and, are off to the coast and picnicking and barbecuing and yeah. So it's very kind of you to give up your time, Chris, and present your UIP it, uh, presentation. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, Chris. Now, at the beginning, I said I would tell you where I stand now, nearly a year after this discussion and debate. 
Well, since then, I've read more widely and much more critically. I've had a chance to talk to colleagues, including Alistair Lewis, who's the chairman of the British Association of Sclerotherapists, Enrique Roche from Barcelona, and most recently, Alessandro Frullini from Bologna and Florence. I've engaged with those others who have the standard guideline views. And here's what's happened. I'm now less convinced by the hierarchy of treatments, and I strongly believe that when properly performed, ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy is at least as effective and just as safe as endothermal ablation. I believe the second position of ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy in the guidance and guidelines is simply not justified. I also believe that ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy is the only scalable solution to the silent crisis of venous disease, in particular leg ulcers. In May of this year at the British Association of Sclerotherapists, Lily Benton gave an excellent presentation on how injecting foam near and around leg ulcers promotes healing. And this was just one talk in a symposium about leg ulcers. There's certainly a need for a much more balanced discussion of the role of ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy in leg vein treatment that breaks free of groupthink. I've also changed my views about phlebectomy. I can see the trend is that over time, fewer and fewer specialists will be performing phlebectomy. Now, I'd like to know what you think. Leave me a comment. I read all of these and I promise to get back to you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. It seems to help get the debate out there and share it with colleagues and patients. Thank you for watching. Why not consider subscribing to my channel? That way you won't miss my next video.